I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, when strange things start to happen to a 14-year-old boy, is it a case of attention-seeking, or was he possessed by the devil? We explore the exorcism of Roland Dell. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, with my preternatural co-host, Alice. That was great, Fred. You know, you really put a lot of effort into the descriptors for our October special episodes, and I appreciate appreciate it. Well, you know, I feel like I've only got so many opportunities to do these sort of supernaturally... S- supernatural... <laughs> Yeah, so I have to really I have to dig deep. I have to dig deep. And you are a Praetor Natural, Alice. Uh, thanks. Because Yeah. Just so I'm not normal. That's fair. I, mm-hmm. I would say that. Uh but there's a You're lot of ways special. you can do that. Think of it as being special. <laughs> I'm not your average bear. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And this is not your average podcast. In fact, you know, these episodes are not even your average episodes of the prosecutors podcast all month we've been doing spooky you know sort of supernatural mysteries that we don't normally get into on the show and today we're going to be talking about an exorcism so that's fun alice have you ever seen the movie the exorcist of course not brett because i don't know if we've actually talked about this on the podcast but i am the most unlikely co-host of a true crime podcast because i am a big weenie when it comes to horror and anything scary so i don't know why i'm on this podcast at all you're facing your fears it's really a testament to you as a person (laughs) and maybe i picked the wrong (laughs) profession too Uh, that's true that's a good point i didn't think about that one all right but i'm i'm hanging up my hat we're done (laughs) it's just gonna be prosecutor singular (laughs) time to retire you're just gonna have to go into full-time podcasting you're gonna get a lot more uh Patrons, if you're going to do that. Uh, so. Please help me, guys, because I'm terrified of things like exorcisms. <laughs> I will say, I mean, before we started recording, I was just telling Brett how I was, my skin was crawling as I was thinking about this story. This is a creepy one, y'all. Yeah, we're, so, Alice, you know, when this episode airs, we'll be only four days away from Halloween. Have you decided what your Halloween costume is going to be this year? So I never pick anything scary because, as I said, I am I would scare myself if I looked in the mirror and I looked scary. Well, do you have a family theme, or you just got you just gonna go as your wonderful self, the the Praetor Natural Alice? We're probably gonna go. It's gonna be a family theme, but it's gonna rotate around my toddler because he loves all things with wheels. So he's probably gonna be some sort of construction vehicle, but we haven't decided what yet. What about you guys? Oh, nice. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do. You know, we really wanted to do something Baby Yoda with a baby because she's so (laughs) cute. And it's like the perfect time to do it. So we're thinking about that. I I tend to like something a little bit more spooky for my Halloween costumes. But hey, that's, you know, I'm a dad. I'm making sacrifices. So (laughs) I may end up being like the Mandalorian or something. I guess we'll I guess we'll find out. We'll follow up with the uh, with the audience on this and let them let them know what we did. Uh, in the post-Halloween episodes that we record. But today, in the spirit of the season, we are finishing up October with our most supernatural story yet. You know, our first three stories we've done in October, they might have had some supernatural elements, particularly the Amityville horror. But at the end of the day, that was a murder, right? Henry Kaifak is an axe murderer. The Mary Celeste may be a ghost ship, but there are no actual ghosts. This one, though, I mean, this one is pure supernatural horror. Today, we're going to be looking into the exorcism of Roland Doe. And we're going to talk about what happened in this case. And we're going to talk about whether or not we think this might actually be a case of demon possession. 
So for those of you who are more on the crime side of true crime, apologies. Enjoy this ode to the season. We'll be back to murder and mayhem next week. But I want to take you back. This is, this is sort of an old case. It's an American exorcism. One of the most well-documented exorcisms in the history of our country. The boy who was supposedly possessed, his name is not actually Roland Doe. That is one of several different aliases that have been used to describe him. As far as I know, the real person who was involved in this exorcism has never been revealed, but it is one of the best documented exorcisms in history. So whether you think it is legitimately the case that there was a devil possession here or not, the horror that we're going to talk about today did happen in one form or another. So I'll take you back to 1949, and on April 29th of that year, a letter arrived at the St. Louis Alexian Rectory from Father Raymond Bishop. And contained within that letter was a harrowing story that not only might prove the existence of the devil, but would change the course of American culture. It was the story of Roland Doe. And the story is one that could have come straight from a horror novel. And like a horror novel, it begins with a simple mystery. At the house of Roland Doe in Cottage City, Maryland, in the middle of January 1949, Roland and his grandmother heard a dripping sound in her bedroom. Nothing more simple than that. They went up to investigate to see exactly what was going on, whether they had a leak or whether something else was responsible but when the picture of Christ shook on the wall shortly after they entered the room and a scratching sound came from the floor, they were fairly certain something else was going on, but something mundane. They thought they had a rat. They called the exterminator who came to the home, covered it up in chemicals and rat poison, but the scratching would not stop. And in fact, it continued for 10 days. And then it stopped as suddenly as it began, and the family said a silent thanks that the rat that had been terrorizing them was finally dead. All except for Roland, because Roland still heard it. For three days, he complained of the sound, a sound that no one else could hear. But then it came back, albeit somewhat different. Now it sounded like squeaking shoes on the floor. And it wasn't in the grandmother's room. It was in Roland's. The sound got louder and more complex until the family could hear it. And they swore that they could hear the sound of marching feet and beating drums. And that's when Roland's mother thought of her aunt who had died only a few days before this all began. And said, is that you, Aunt Tilly? Oh, Brett, before we go on, I mean, like you said, this is all well documented and it reads really like a horror novel, but these things are documented quite well and we know they happened, right? I mean, like I said, this is this is definitely the most well documented example of a supposed possession by the devil, probably in history, certainly in the history of the United States. We're going to talk more about this later, about how this was documented. It actually was, it was kept a secret for a very long time by the Catholic Church, and only in the last 30 years or so really started to come to light. But the family swore that this happened, and there were multiple witnesses to this and many of the other things we're going to see. And in fact, by the end of this, there were dozens of people who saw something happen that happened along the course of this story that we're going to tell. Right, so things only get weirder. So remember, Roland's mother said, is that you, Aunt Tilly? When there was no answer, Roland's mother asked for a sign. She said, if it's you, knock three times. There was a rush of air and the sound of three distinct knocks were on the floorboard. But apparently, Roland's mother wasn't satisfied. So she asked for a repeat performance, but this time she asked for four knocks and four knocks she received. And then things got crazy. The entire bed began to shake, growing more and more violent with every second. Then the entire blanket on the bed was pulled up from the mattress and stood up as if it was held in place. 
and when someone touched the blanket, it fell back into its normal position. All of a sudden, calm returned, but the sound of scratching continued. There were other occurrences, too. An orange and a pear flew across the entire room where Roland was standing. The kitchen table was upset without any movement on the part of Roland. Milk and food were thrown off the table and stove, inexplicably. The breadboard was thrown onto the floor. Outside of the kitchen, a coat on its hanger flew across the room. A comb flew violently through the air and extinguished some candles that had been blessed by a priest. That's a particularly evocative scene, right? Like oh. a priest had blessed some candles for the family because obviously they were having some weird things going on and thought maybe we'll bless some candles. And then you have this this comb that flies through the air and you can just imagine sort of the, the candles lined up, right? And the And the comb just sort of like slicing through them through the flames, extinguishing them all. I mean, that's, it's such a great, it's a great visual. Yeah. And, you know, as if uh, to really make sure they understood what was happening, a Bible was thrown directly at Roland's feet, even though it didn't injure him in any way, but it's like a throwdown. And now these weird occurrences didn't just happen in Roland's home. While the family was visiting a friend in Boonesboro, Maryland, Roland was sitting in a rocker, and that rocker spun completely around, though through no effort on the part of the boy. And at school, weird things happened too. Roland's desk at school moved around on the floor in the herky-jerky manner. I don't even know how to say that. Planchette? Planchette. Is it planchette? Okay. <laughs> It is. Oh, thank you. Roland's desk at school moved around on the floor in the herky-jerky manner of a planchette on a Ouija board. I mean, things are just getting weirder. <laughs> yeah, they are. And I don't even know why I'm going to ask this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Have you ever used a Ouija board before? <laughs> and you're asking that because, of course, I'm terrified of these things. So, no, I haven't used a Ouija board. Of Have you? <laughs> I don't oh, yeah, think you guys understand. I'm like the biggest weenie <laughs> of all time. And Brett's like the opposite. He goes hunting for terror. So a couple things about what you just talked about. I want to get to the Ouija board here in a second. But, you know, the question that's going to be following us throughout the discussion we have about this story, whether it takes today or two days or whatever, is, is Roland faking this or is it real? Because as we've said, you know, this is not like... One of those things where we don't even know whether this story really happened and, you know, it's just could be co completely made up. It seems like this stuff happened and it's just a question of is Roland doing it to gain attention or is something supernatural going on? So, you know, you have this scene where he's in the rocking chair and he's spinning around. There have been several books written about this case and the way it's described. You know, he's getting more and more withdrawn, more and more scared, and he's essentially sitting in the rocking chair, you know, with his knees like up against his chest and his hands around his knees and his feet, his feet aren't even on the ground. And as he's sitting there like that, just inexplicably, the rocking chair starts spinning around in a circle, which doesn't even seem possible, right? Like how, how would he even do that if he wanted to do it? You know, what's really interesting about this Ouija board stuff. So one thing we haven't mentioned is before all this started. So you might be asking yourself, why now? Why would Roland all of a sudden and his family all of a sudden seemingly out of nowhere start to be terrorized by spirits, whether it's a spirit or a demon or whatever? Why is this happening now? It's not like, you know, they're not like, the uh, the Lutzes who move into the house where everybody was murdered and there's a clear reason why it's starting for them. Well, before it all began, you remember Aunt Tilly. So Aunt Tilly, she lived in St. Louis, but she would often visit the family. And Aunt Tilly was very much into the supernatural. She was a spiritualist. So she believed in life after death and she believed that you could contact the dead, both through things like Ouija boards and seances and, and other ways that people who were spiritualists contact the dead. 
and she would involve Roland in this because for her it was a very fun thing. And one of the core tenets of spiritualism, I don't know how much you guys know about spiritualism, but one of the core tenets of spiritualism is that there are no bad spirits. So it's sort of this theory that, almost like a Gnostic or a Manichaean theory, that spirit is pure, and to the extent people are evil, it's sort of the flesh that's evil, and you know the flesh can confuse spirits, but really spirits are all good. And so this thought is there's no danger in reaching out to the dead and attempting to contact the dead, because the dead are not evil. And this stands in sort of stark contrast to a lot of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, a lot of other organized religions that think there's a big danger in reaching out to the dead and to the other world because you risk opening the door to things that are evil, right? Whether it's demons or evil spirits or whatever. But in any event, Aunt Tilly would come and she would show Roland how to use the Ouija board. And he, they had a lot of fun with it and they would play with it all the time. And then Aunt Tilly died. We talked about this, how she died. And she was one of Roland's really good friends. And it was a big depressing moment for him. And he really missed her. And so he started playing with the Ouija board by himself. He would do the Ouija board alone in an attempt to contact Aunt Tilly. And if you know anything about Ouija boards, you're never supposed to do that. You know, you never use the Ouija board by yourself. You're always supposed to use it with someone else. Because the idea is that in using it by yourself, you make yourself more susceptible to things like possession. So Roland is doing this thing that you're not supposed to do. He's playing with a Ouija board by himself. And that's when all this weird stuff happens. And he's the one who says, when I'm in school and my desk is jerking all over the place, it's moving like the planchette moves on a Ouija board. If you've ever used a Ouija board, it doesn't move smoothly. It it does jerk. Like you ask a question and it's like jerking from one letter to another. So you can sort of imagine that kind of movement is the way that his desk is moving. Oof. That's really helpful because you're right. I just got wrapped up in how creepy everything was. I didn't even think about why now, what, what happened that this would begin to occur at this moment. So that was great background. Have I ever told you my, my ghost story, my only ghost story I have, Alice? No. I can't believe you only have one. I feel like this is a good point to share it. Please do. I know. It's sad. Somebody told me, so I, I have attempted to use the Ouija board on many occasions. I don't honestly have that much luck with it. And I had somebody look at me once in the middle of a, a, just a terrible failed Ouija board session and say, you have dead eyes. And <laughs> what they meant by that was not like a, like a creepy like, you know, you have dead eyes. It was, you know, you just, you just, you have no connection to the spirit world whatsoever, you know, get away from me so I can get somebody who actually can make this work anyway. So yeah, I don't have a lot of good ghost stories, but I do have one and I'll tell it now. Cause it relates to, to this, the whole knocking thing, you know, asking the spirit to knock is very common in spiritualism. That's a way that a lot of people try and contact the dead or whatnot. So one time I was with some friends and we were in this haunted house or supposedly haunted house and we were being all creepy and spooky so we went into this room where the owner of the house had committed suicide you know a hundred years before had committed suicide in this room and it was like a round room really cool room it's like a library really neat and it had all these different doors because it's a round room and it's basically in the center of the house and you can enter it from all these different parts of the house and so to start this off we were like Let's close all the doors and then we're going to like do like a seancey type thing, right? So we close all the doors or actually I close all the doors. So I walk around closing each door until they're all closed. And then I sit down and we sort of start this thing. And this guy who is sitting sort of on the other side of the room says, if there's, if there's anybody here, you know, give us a sign. Maybe you can knock or something like that, right? Sort of like playing up to this whole knocking thing. And after he says that, immediately, seriously, is immediately after he says that, one of the doors that I had closed myself slowly swings open. Ugh. That was super creepy. That was the only thing that happened that night. Nothing else happened. But that was really cool, right? I mean, I'm telling you, I closed it myself. I know it was closed. 
He he said that, and literally he asked for a sign, and right after he does, that door opens and <sighs> just like swings. And it was one of those things you can imagine because everybody's watching as this door inch by inch swings open until it's fully open. So that's my ghost story. Ooh, I'm sure you loved that, and I would have probably prompted, promptly started crying. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes to show, if you don't want to know whether or not there are ghosts around you, don't ask. That's right. So. That's right. And by the way, back when we did the uh, Amityville Horror, we did the little test about where we asked for the ghost to talk on our uh, recording, and there was no ghost. Uh, I listened. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know you're really disappointed about I know. About Everybody's that. very upset about that. We'll I probably try that again <laughs> at the end of this episode. But, you know. Anyway, sorry for that aside. You guys know how much I love asides. Let's get back into the story. So we know all this because it's recorded in a diary written by the priest that we mentioned earlier, and he had mailed that diary to the rectory. And the whole reason he did that was because he wanted there to be a record of what happened, and he thought it would be useful for other priests in the future who could see sort of the progression of this and what the priest had to do as a part of the exorcism. So he has recorded all of this from his personal interactions with the family, with Roland Doe, the things that he's been told Later on, it'll be things he sees firsthand, but right now he's, he's hearing from the family who's telling him these things. And according to his diary, there were 14 different witnesses at this point who could testify to the events we just mentioned, the things flying across the room, the spinning seat, the moving desk. Now, the family was Lutheran, and they called some Lutheran ministers in to sort of consult with. One of those was a man named Luther Miles Schultz. And he had an interest in parapsychology, and he had an interest in spiritualism. We talked about this before. This was big back in the first half of the 20th century, really kind of dying down by the time we got to the 40s and then would sort of erupt again in the 60s and 70s. But he had an interest in this, and so he actually invited the boy to come to his house so that he could observe him. And he was not disappointed. The clawing sound that that Roland had heard before followed him, and this Lutheran minister heard it. And so he tried to pray over the boy to ask for sort of God's blessing over him and to end this stuff, but it didn't help. Now, the minister, he was a big believer in science. You know, he believed in God, but he believed in science too. And so he called a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist, the, he looked at Roland and said, look, possession thing you're talking about, it's not something I believe in. It's probably just a normal teenage boy. Roland was 13 years old at this time, going through the kind of things that a 13-year-old boy goes through, and weird things are happening, and, and he's doing weird things, and he's acting out or whatever. Um, this didn't really satisfy Schultz, so he asked another physician to take a look at Roland, and this physician said, look, he's perfectly normal. He might be a little high-strung, which is... You know, the understatement of the century if he's making all this stuff happen. I was going to say, I'd be pretty high strung if this stuff was happening to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the family, so, you know, we sort of tried the Lutherans and that didn't really work out. So they call a spiritualist who had been friends with Roland's aunt. And she was called in and attempted traditional methods of eliminating the spirit. Things like lighting sage, performing purifying rituals, that kind of stuff. But she didn't have any success either. So finally, Schultz, good Lutheran though he was, told the family, you need to find a priest. The Catholics know about these kind of things. So that's what the family did. They reached out to the Catholic diocese, in particular a Father Hughes, who was a Catholic priest in the St. James Parish in Mount Rainier, Maryland, which was near to where they lived. And they asked for his advice. Now, he suggested blessed candles, which we talked about earlier. He was the one who provided those candles that got extinguished. Holy water and, and some prayers that he thought would, would help. Now, he did not meet Roland in person, but he gave some of this holy water to the mother, water that he had blessed. He told her to sprinkle it on all the rooms, sprinkle it on Roland. But when she placed the bottle on a shelf, the bottle actually flew across the room. At this point, she decides to hold to put these lighted candles alongside Roland, and when she did this, the whole bed, which she and her son were in, 
started to move back and forth and the mattress is swaying all over the place. And then the scratching, it wasn't just on the floor or on the bed, it was on the boy. On February 26th, 1949, more than a month after the scratching sounds began, Roland awoke with scratches on his body. For the next four nights, the situation got progressively worse, much, much worse. Roland's mother had been thinking about taking her son to St. Louis, where she was from and where she had family. She didn't tell him this, but the next morning when she's trying to decide whether or not they should leave, Roland doubles up in pain and screams, and she sees the word Lewis scratched in to his chest. She then says, when should we leave? And the word Saturday appears on his hip. Ugh. Can you, I mean, as a parent, can you imagine the, this would be terrifying if it were happening to you. But now that I'm a parent, this would be even more terrifying if it were happening to my child because there's nothing I could do about it. And that, you know, that goes back to this whole question of, is this real? What is happening? It doesn't really matter, right? I mean, from her perspective, obviously it matters if her son is possessed by a devil but this is a really bad thing going on with her son, and she's going to do anything she can and whatever it takes to get him out of this. Absolutely. And, you know, so she does take Roland to St. Louis, but things did not approve, improve upon their arrival at St. Louis. On March 9th, 1949, the violent moving of the mattress and the scratching on the boy's body was observed by his mother, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin of college age, a friend of the family, and by Father Bishop, the author of the diary, who had been asked to see the boy by a cousin of Roland's, who was in class with Bishop at a local university. So we talked about this earlier, how these things definitely happened. There are multiple witnesses, and here we have the father seeing this supernatural activity around Roland himself. So Bishop had arrived that day in the hope that blessing the home would alleviate the boy's distress. It did not. Over the next seven days, manifestations continued. More scratches, more objects moved, including a large piece of furniture weighing more than the boy could possibly move. On March 16th, the Archbishop of St. Louis granted permission for an exorcism. Father Bishop... Father William Bowdern and Father Walter Halloran arrived at the home of the boy to perform the exorcism. For those of you who are not familiar with the Catholic rite of exorcism, let me just tell you that it is lengthy. You can read it in the catechism or online uh, about what the Roman rite of exorcism entails. But it begins with the exhortation for the Lord Jesus Christ and all his saints to bless the priests and the person afflicted and to give strength to those conducting the exorcism. When that's completed, the priest addresses the demon saying, I command you, unclean spirit, whoever you are, along with all your minions now attacking this servant of God by the mysteries of the incarnation, passion, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the descent of the Holy Spirit, by the coming of our Lord for judgment, that you tell me by some sign your name and the day and hour of your departure. I command you, moreover, to obey me to the letter. I, who am a minister of God, despite my unworthiness, nor shall you be emboldened to harm in any way this creature of God, or the bystanders, or any of their possessions. Now, what I just said was the prayer called, um, I don't know how to say that. The Precipio. Precipio, with a hard C? Mm -hmm. You're so good at this, and you're not even Catholic. <laughs> So what I just read is the prayer called the Precipio, which means I command. It was when the priest reached this part of the ritual that things really got interesting. Yeah, things get weird. Scratches appear on the boy's legs, his thighs, his stomach, his back, his chest, his face, his throat. I mean, you've got this time where the priest have really, you know, this is a, this is a really important point. In the exorcism, this is when the priest is taking control of the situation and taking control of the unclean spirit. And the unclean spirit is fighting back. 
you had these scratches appear and and they look like sort of slight lacerations so there is some blood that's flowing from these some of the marks look like thorn scratches but others are more raised and they look almost like brands and the brand marks were particularly painful for Roland. The most distinctive markings on the body were what was described, and I wish we had a picture of this, as a picture of the devil uh, on Roland's right leg and the word hell imprinted on Roland's chest. The imprint of the devil and hell appeared at the repetition of the Precipio, demanding the evil spirit to identify himself. I mean, go back. So what Alice just read you, there's several things that happen here. Just commanding the unclean spirit to obey the servant of God, wants to know by some sign who this is and when they intend to leave, right? And so what do you get? You get something that looks like a picture of the devil, something that says hell. It seems to appear exactly when, when it's asked for. The devil was apparently portrayed sort of in red. The, the arms of the devil were held above his head. They seemed to be webbed, giving what was described as the appearance of a bat. And once again, this comes from the priest's diary. So supposedly this is something the priest saw with his own eyes. And all the observers in the room agreed that this was sort of what you would think of as an image of the devil and could be nothing else. To the question of how many demons were possessing Roland, a single line was scratched on Roland's right leg, which led them to believe it was one. When asked when the demons would depart, an X appeared on the boy's body. Now, this required some assumptions, but X, obviously, is the Roman numeral for 10. So the priest assumed that that's what it meant and believed that it indicated that the exorcism would take 10 days or that the devil would depart at 10 o'clock. They were hoping for the latter because... Obviously, then they don't have to do this for 10, 10 days. 10 days is a long time. <laughs> 10 days is a long time. This ends up lasting a lot longer than 10 days. At least during the first days, the X had no significance, and they just weren't sure exactly what it meant. There were also markings on the legs, which seemed to be long scratches. They didn't know what those meant either. Marks were made on the boy's body more than 25 different times during the course of the evening, each mark causing the boy to double up with pain. As the night wore on, Roland began to sing. This is weird, right? So one of the things, there are several signs you can look for to know whether or not something is a, a possession or mental illness. And what you're supposedly supposed to look at is can the person do things they could not do before? Do they know things they didn't know before? And so he starts to sing. He's apparently not a very good singer. He doesn't like to sing, but he sings in this sort of high-pitched, perfect voice songs including down on the swanee river and old man river have like a river theme and that was just the first night for days on end the exorcism continued every night the priests would come to roland and every night they would be treated to a violent struggle roland would spit and claw at them during his trance periods and then be unable to remember any of it during periods of lucidity roland claimed to see visions of a dark hooded figure tormenting him then, Roland would fall back into a trance stage as if under some demonic power. From the diary, quote, Violent shouting with fiendish laughter were a part of the phenomena. The shouting resembled the barking of a dog and the snapping of Roland's teeth were truly diabolical. It should be stated again that the violent reactions always followed upon the prayers of the exorcism. There had been no violence from the boy before the exorcism was begun on the night of March 16th. And also, the singing continued. Roland did not like to sing and wasn't very good at it like Brett mentioned previously. But to the shock of everyone, when he sang during the exorcisms, he was said to sing, quote, very beautifully in a dear voice and with real finesse. This included the Blue Danube, a song no one believed that Roland had ever heard, and a song he claimed not to know in the light of morning when the trance had left him. So, at the conclusion of ten days from when the X appeared on Roland, the manifestations of this possession seemed to cease, and everybody was very thankful for this. They thought, okay, we've done it, this has ended, ten days has passed, He's free. And for three days that followed, everything was fine. 
Everything was peaceful. But then whatever was tormenting Roland, whether it was something in his own mind or a demon, returned with a vengeance. After all this had happened, the family had decided, look, Lutheranism was great, but we pretty much believe in Catholicism now, so we're going to become Catholic. And it was decided it'll be really good for Roland to go ahead and be baptized as a Catholic, just to sort of both to symbolize what he's come through and to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And as we said, everything was normal. But then on the way to the church, it was as if the spirit had reasserted itself. And Roland said, quote, so you're going to baptize me, ha ha, and you think you will drive me out with holy communion, ha ha. And then at that point, supposedly Roland lurches at the wheel of the car he's being driven in and almost manages to wreck it before his uncle can regain control of the wheel. And Roland is exercising strength that no one thought he could exercise as a 13-year-old boy. And it actually takes his father and his uncle to hold him down in the back seat during these spells so that he doesn't wreck the car. The weirdest thing about this is he, you know, they're on their way to the church and he's coming in and out of these trances where he seems to be controlled by the devil. And before this would happen, the car radio, which was on, would suddenly cease to function. It would go silent, and then Roland would explode in this rage. And then the radio would come back on, and these trances would end as quickly as they had begun, and Roland would be himself again. By the time they reached the church, it took three men to drag him inside, and he resisted with a heretofore unseen fury. It was hard, but they managed to complete the baptism. I, you know, this is kind of a weird baptism. Usually you get baptized of your own accord, but <laughs> Roland sort of, he's being sort of drugged through this one, right? I mean, maybe Roland wanted to do it, but the demon didn't. And they went back to the exorcism. It's like, okay, this is not done. We thought this was done, but it's not done. What we really need to do now that he's been baptized is we need to administer Holy Communion. For those of you who are Catholic, well, if those of you who are Catholic, you know this. If you're not Catholic, Holy Communion is one of the most sacred rites in Catholicism. Most Christians take communion at some point, but for Catholics, it has this heightened thing because you have the real presence of Jesus Christ. So you have the blood and you have the body. And Jesus said in the, in the final supper before he was crucified that, you know, this is my blood, this is my body, and this is going to be a symbol of your salvation. And so it's a very important thing. And the thought was, if we, if we give communion to Roland, there's no way that the demon can sort of exist in a body that's, that's taken communion. Similar difficulties. Had to basically force feed him. Um, and it took a lot of prayers. And only after all those prayers was Roland finally calm enough that he could take communion. But unfortunately, despite all the good theories, that was not the end of it. Finally came Monday, April 18th, did the day after Easter. And again, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with the Catholic or Christian faith, Easter is a very big holiday. It's a very important holiday. It's the you know rising of Christ from three days being dead. And this was perhaps the most violent day of all of them to date, and they've been violent so far. Roland cursed and fought the priests, and it took several men to restrain him. Roland began to experience seizures, and then at around 1045, in the midst of the violence and curses, a voice seemed to emerge from Roland that no one had heard before. It said, Satan, Satan, I am Saint Michael, and I command you, Satan, and the other evil spirits to leave the body in the name of Dominus, immediately, now, now, now. For ten minutes, Roland was racked by violent contortions, unlike anything the priests had seen up until that point. Then, as suddenly as they began, they ended. And Roland said in a clear, childish voice, He's gone. Here is what Roland said he saw, according to the diary. Quote, he said there was a brilliant white light, and in that light stood a very beautiful man with flowing, wavy hair that blew in the breeze. He wore a white robe that fitted closely to his body. 
the material gave the impression of scales. Only the upper half of the body of this man was visible to Roland. In his right hand, he held up a wavy and fiery sword in front of him. With his left hand, he pointed down to a pit or cave. Roland said he saw the devil standing in the cave. Roland felt the heat from the cave and saw the flames. First, the devil fought, resisting the angel and laughing diabolically. Then the angel smiled at Roland and spoke, but Roland heard only the word Dominus. As the angel spoke, the devil and about ten of his helpers ran back into the fire of the cave or pit. After the devil disappeared, the letters SPITE appeared on the bars of the cave. As the devils disappeared into the pit, Roland felt a pulling or tugging in the region of his stomach. As the devils disappeared, he felt a snapping and then felt relaxed completely. He said that this was the most relaxed feeling he had since the whole experience began in January. Wow, that was a long time. I Through all of this trauma, I forgot that it had started back in January. Yeah, and we have, for the benefit of the listeners, we cut a lot out of this. I mean, we could have gone through every single night, every single night of the exorcism, what happened in those. We tried to give you sort of an overview of what was happening. But the priests are with him every single night. Basically from the middle of March, we're going to go through the timeline here in a second, but basically through the middle of March, all the way through Easter, doing this this ceremony sort of over and over and over again. And they're doing it. At some point, Roland sort of passes out and falls asleep. They go home and get some rest. The days are pretty normal. And then night, they go back and this starts over again. A couple things about what we just talked about. I mean... Roland is is either sort of an incredibly intelligent, precocious 13-year-old who knows a lot about sort of Catholicism and, and lore and everything else and is really picking up on this stuff and is just really good at faking this or something else is going on. So Dominus means Lord in the name of the Lord, obviously, uh, is a very common phrase in any any sort of Christian religion. Jesus Christ is Lord, so when they say Dominus, that's who they're referring to. Michael is one of the archangels. I think he is essentially the archangel. There are several, but the thing about Michael that's special is in the book of Revelation, and I'll just read to you from the book of Revelation, we are recounted this story of the rebellion in heaven in which Satan attempts to take the throne of heaven essentially he's trying to overthrow god and man you know there's been so many books movies and everything else made about that concept including paradise lost which is one of the most famous uh, epic poems of all time but i'll read to you from the book of revelation it says and there was war in heaven michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not neither was their place found any more in heaven and the idea is that Michael defeated the armies of Satan and then threw them from heaven. So if you've read Paradise Lost, it begins with sort of Satan and his angels after this happens, awakening in hell. And Satan says that famous line, uh, better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. And so that's the idea. So it's very appropriate of all people. So at the beginning of this exorcism, if you've ever read the catechism, and if you've read the rite of exorcism, in addition to the things we read you, there's also this sort of like roll call of saints and and everybody else, right? And it essentially lists every possible person, every possible angel that could assist from Jesus on down. I mean, Jesus and Mary and all the saints and all the virgins and all the priests and all the everybody and Michael um, and Gabriel and, and all those guys, right? Get listed and Michael's one of them. But it really, of all those people, the most appropriate person to sort of show up and defeat this devil, this demon, is Michael. He's done it before, right? And this notion of him sort of casting the demon down into this pit where 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 the devil is sort of 
sort of locked up. I mean, that's straight out of Revelation, right? So once again, I mean, Roland might have been very familiar with all this. Um, his family was not particularly religious. Like I said, they were Lutheran, but they weren't really devout Lutherans. It's not that they were going to church all the time. So if he knew this, it wasn't because, you know, he learned it in Sunday school. It's because he, he picked it up somewhere else. But whatever the case, whether you believe that the archangel Michael made an appearance or not, that was it. From that day forward, there were no further demonic manifestations. So if he had mental illness that was causing this, that cured it, at least as far as these manifestations go. If he had a demon, he was exercised. And the priest kept up with him and the family, they converted to Catholicism. They followed through with that. And in the bishop's diary, he writes, August 19th, 1951, Roland and his father and mother visited the brothers. Roland, now 16, is a fine young man. His father and mother also became Catholic, having received their first Holy Communion on Christmas Day, 1950. As I said, they kept up with him. He was eventually married in the early 70s. He had several children, lived a perfectly normal life, untroubled by this exorcism. He remained in touch with the priest who had conducted the exorcism really for the rest of their lives. And it's interesting, if you think about it, you know, this, this guy probably still alive, maybe still alive. I mean, we don't know, you know, I mean, he'd be pretty old at this point, but you could have lived right next door to him and never known that he was the subject of this incredibly famous exorcism. And one of the reasons you wouldn't know is the priest had decided we're going to keep this quiet. We don't want people to know who he is. We don't want this to follow him. We want, we don't want this to be the source of a lot of speculation or aggrandizement or tabloid journalism or anything like that. So they write the diary and the diary is supposed to be used just for priests who may have to conduct an exorcism in the future. And that's what they do. They make it, they make it available to them, but not to many, not to anybody else. But there was one person, one person who knew about this, who had no interest in keeping quiet. And that was the Lutheran minister who we talked about way at the beginning, Luther Schultz, who once again was fascinated by this stuff and was fascinated by parapsychology and was the first person who said, Hey, talk to the Catholics, the Catholics, they get this stuff. And he goes to speak at a meeting of a Washington DC branch of the society for parapsychology. And he talks about this case and the meeting was later written up in a newspaper at Georgetown university. And there was a student at Georgetown at the time who read that throwaway tiny little article in the Georgetown university newspaper. And was intrigued. His name, William Peter Blatty. Now you may not know who he is, but you've probably know about his book that he wrote that was eventually made into a movie called The Exorcist. And now a little bit of personal history, that staircase from The Exorcist. Now I'd said earlier, and it's true, I've never watched The Exorcist, but there's the famous staircase. Um, and it is actually a staircase at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. And I used to run up those stairs uh, with my See, that's terrifying group. in of itself that you ran up those it stairs. Is, oh, it's terrifying. <laughs> it was terrifying for like many reasons, not just because it was part of the movie or that I could fall down them because it is a very steep set of stone steps, but also because I would, you know, heave at the top of the stairs each time at the end of the run. And that was not the end of the run. That was like near the beginning of the run. But anyways, all that to say is, though I haven't seen the movie, I'm very familiar with those stairs because of my running group. There you go, Alice. You're a part, you're a part of paranormal history and, and we didn't even know it. <laughs> That's right. That's all I can offer here. It, it, well, well, you know, you mentioned how um, most people, um, the priest wanted to keep this quiet. And I understand, right? It It's not that, the idea is not that Roland did something to bring this upon himself. I know we talked about him, you know, using the Ouija board by himself, but when you're possessed, the idea is you didn't do anything to become possessed. And so he just happened to be kind of the conduit for the supernatural event. 
I can't imagine. You know, he, like you said, he may still be alive now and to have lived through that. And I'm glad that it never reoccurred. What a thing to live through. Yeah. What a thing to live through. I mean, that's the kind of story you want to tell your kids. Well, I don't know if you want to tell your kids that, I but know. I would definitely tell my kids that story if I had gone through that. And it's interesting. And when you're trying to decide the veracity of this story and, you know, we're probably about to wrap it up today, but tomorrow we'll talk more about this. You think about Roland and you think about the priest and you think about, you know, one of the reasons that people don't believe the Lutz's story when it comes to Amityville is because the way the story came out was in a novel that they were trying to make a whole bunch of money out of. Right. And so what's been said by other people involved is, look, we just made this up because we knew it'd be a great story. We could sell a lot of books and we could become millionaires. And that's what happened. That's what they did here. No one sought that. Like no one, no one tried to become famous off this. No one tried to capitalize on this. Like I said, nobody even knew about this until much later. I think even when The Exorcist came out, I'm not entirely sure whether when The Exorcist came out that Blatty said it was based on a true story. He intentionally changed the sex from a boy to a girl. He was asked to do that by some of the priests just to sort of further add a level of distance between what had actually happened and the story because he reached out to all of them. He wanted the priest to sort of give him the inside story and they wouldn't do it because they said, look, we're, we're sworn to secrecy. I know you know about it. I know you're writing about it, but we're not going to talk to you about it. So if you would do this for us though, make it a girl, that would help. And he did that. And I think the fact that everybody acted that way kind of lends it some more credibility. I also think, and we're going to talk about this more tomorrow, some of the skepticism of the priest involved lends credibility to it. I mean, these were not, these were not credulous people. These were not people who fail for everything. These were Jesuits. And if you're Catholic, you know what that means. These are not means uneducated. They're the liberal, right. They're very, they're very um, liberal in the sense of they, they seek knowledge and, you know, very into the learning. Exactly. They're scientists. They're highly educated. They're the people who tend to be, there's a reason Georgetown is a Jesuit school. You know, that's what they do all these guys who are involved were Jesuits. So I think that also adds something to it, but we're going to talk about that more tomorrow. Going to leave you guys with a little bit more, give you one more episode before Halloween is upon us. I hope you guys have been enjoying this spookiness. I know it seems like you guys have been enjoying it. I know, um, it's a little different from what we normally do, but if you guys have any questions or comments on this episode or anything else we've been doing, you can reach us at prosecutorspod at gmail.com, at prosecutorspod for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We're on YouTube. Some of you may be watching this on YouTube. Hello, YouTube folks. If you are, we're on Reddit. You can support us on Patreon if you want to, though you never have to. But otherwise, you know, we will we'll be back tomorrow. Alice, do you have any, any other spooky stories you want to add before we say goodnight? Not at all, except come back. And you know, this was not just a freaky story. We also have a, a lot of unusual things to discuss and even some prosecutor angles. Yeah. And you know, Alice here is a scaredy cat. So she's really making a sacrifice for the audience. Talking I really about am. You guys this, can't see that we'll my probably face. give her nightmares tonight. <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> so everybody say a prayer for Alice if you're the praying type. Um, but, okay, well, until tomorrow, we'll be back then with more of this story. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutor. riot i have no clue what happened to the ship or whatever but you two are a riot (laughs) we are right we are hilarious i mean we we definitely sounded like a little like we had a couple of uh, barrels of alcohol in that one i think being in the same room definitely has an effect we get giggly we were what is it good or bad though i mean i guess it depends on your point of view i like it
why you listen to us if you don't like laughing because we laugh, we laugh all the time in basically every episode. Yeah. Yeah. We... So that's just sort of part of the show. And we definitely laughed a lot in that episode. <laughs> we did. That was a funny one. I mean, it was. It that was one hilarious. was pretty ridiculous. We really did that one up. But. <laughs>